Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it's time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and get this started. Alright, first question. On your 5x5 novice program, should I add to the deadlift 10 pounds each deadlift session so that the squat will not catch up to the deadlift? You guys kind of see my response down there. Alright, people make some really, really bizarre assumptions about these programs, um, all of these novice linear progression programs. And you can tell when they ask these questions that they have never run any sort of novice LP before. Um, and this sort of question is extremely common, by the way, for these programs. But again, let me come over to the point. Anyone who has asked such a question has obviously never run a novice linear progression. People say, well, what do you mean? How can you tell? Because they would already know that it won't work that way. Because people have in their head... Oh yeah, since I, I squat every session and deadlift every other session, if I add five pounds each one time, the squat will pass the deadlift. No, it won't. No, it won't. If the squat was capable of passing the deadlift, that would be like just ludicrous. It would be ludicrous. You guys do know you can't add five pounds forever. You can't add five pounds forever. You're going to hit a stall oftentimes relatively quickly. And as soon as the squat stalls and you miss a rep or the form breaks down, you're going to reduce the weight 10%. So let me put it this way. Let's say you started with 95 pounds on the squat and 135 on the deadlift. You're adding five pounds every workout. Let's say you get six weeks deep, right? It's 15 pounds times six. By that time, I promise you the squat will have stalled once and you're going to have reduced it 15 pounds. And the deadlift is going to keep moving. Do you guys see what I'm saying? You're still going to reach a case where six months deep into the program, your deadlift is going to still be 50 pounds heavier than your squat. The squat, because we're increasing it every time, and it's obviously a lift that most people lift less on, is going to have more weight resets. Because if, if anyone thinks that you're going to add five pounds to your squat three times a week for a year straight, that's, that's mathematically impossible. Okay, You can't actually do that. You will hit a stall. I can assure you that you're not going to get to a thousand pound squat for five sets of five. Okay, It's not going to happen. Hopefully people understand that. Uh, we add weight every session on a novice program because that is the only way to ensure that you're working hard. That is the only way to ensure that you're working hard. Because if you just give a novice and tell them, oh, squat five rep sets as long as it feels heavy. Just, you know, as long as it feels heavy and it's challenging, that's good enough. Well, I can assure you the year deep into the program, if you tell the novice that, they're going to be working with 155 pounds on the bar. Not 275, not 300, 155, 135. Because you didn't make them get stronger. You didn't make them do it. That's why we add weight. It's to ensure that they do that. And then obviously they hit a wall and have to reduce. But when they hit the wall and have to reduce, we know that we are now at the perfect weight for the reps and sets, don't we? It's self-regulating. We could change that. We could change all of it from five pounds to two and a half pounds. And four months deep into the program, you will be lifting the exact same weight on every single exercise. It won't matter. All right, next question. How should MMA fighters and BJJ athletes add in their repetition work? I would have thought the volume would be lower due to training their sport four to five times per week. Why would you think that? Do you think your minimum effective volume to see muscle growth and strength increases changes because you're doing sports on your other days? I want you to really think about that. Let's assume that to, to make your quads bigger and stronger for your hamstrings, you need X amount of work in a, in a given training session. But you practice another sport on the other day. Do you think that volume goes down? Of course not. Of 
course not. It's still going to be the same. Now, because you do conditioning and you practice your sport on other days, you're probably in better shape. You can probably do more work in a single workout. You can probably do better work density. Yeah? So, what, what's your better option? Your volume doesn't need to go down. Your frequency needs to go down. All right, look at any of the, the West Side or Conjugate type templates for, for fighters. What are they usually? They're like three-day templates instead of four is pretty common. Or for, say, football players. They run them on three-day templates oftentimes instead of four. Why? They have to do other work. They have to do other work. And they're all in shape, so they can handle a lot of volume in one session. Now, if you're doing all this other work in GPP and conditioning, which is a big part of all their practice, are you re-stimulating some of the muscle protein synthesis? Yeah, you are. So you can get away with a little less frequency. You can go ahead and stack the volume high. Right? We can run an upper lower three days a week max work, speed work, whatever. We can run that for them. They're in shape. They can handle a lot of volume in one session, but they have to do stuff on other days. They can't handle as many days. But it'll all balance out. No, you need to do it that way. The same thing. I mean, I would have them do tons of speed work. Do tons of speed work. Bands, chains all that stuff but repetition work we don't really even in these sort of training systems we don't go above like fives or sixes for any of the classic lift variations even in the repetition models your rep work is done on stuff that's easier to recover from what do you see me do do you see me doing 10 rep squats no but i do five by ten hip thrusts hip thrusts build the quads glutes and hamstrings yes can it put just as much size on your lower body as a squat? Yes. It's easier to recover from. Okay. Advanced athletes and advanced lifters have to factor those things in. It's a different game. Different game. But that's the way you need to look at it. It needs to be lower frequency, but maintaining individual training session volume needs to be high enough to stimulate adaptation. So a three-day template makes sense for them. All right, next question. Hi, Jason. No gym in my area has a glute ham raise. Is back extension a good substitute for ham extra hamstring development? All right, uh, really quick, this guy did multiple questions. Just a heads up, guys. It's hard for me to do these as multiple questions. I'm probably going to ignore your later questions if you throw a bunch. Make individual posts because I don't need to see that there are five questions from the same person. I just read individual questions. I don't look at your name. I look to see do you have a good question or not, and it makes organizing a lot easier for me. Uh, over to the point. How can a back extension replace a glute ham raise? I you to think about that. What is a back extension going to be? It's technically going to be like a hip hinge. How can that replace a glute ham raise? A glute ham raise is not a hip hinge. Okay. Why do we do glute ham raises? Well, people say, well, because obviously it's an exercise that moves the body through space, and that's good, and it works the hamstrings. Well, yeah, that, that's part of it. The glute ham raise involves knee flexion. Why does that matter? Because out of your three heads of your hamstrings, only two of them are fully activated with a hip hinge. The glute ham raise, because of the knee movement, fully recruits all three heads of the hamstring potentially, particularly with an extra emphasis on the head that doesn't get worked on our hip hinges, our deadlifts, our good mornings, things like that. So if you don't have access to a glute ham raise, you need to do hamstring curls. Okay. Now, do I mean that every novice lifter needs to? No. Does any lifter who is strong and cares about hamstring tears on their deadlift need to do them? Yes. 
Okay. Does any field athlete who is worried about knee damage twisting a knee when they pivot or twist out on a playing field? Yes. Okay. Those people need to worry about this. Both of those people need to worry about this. If you do not, if you're either one of those people and you do not have a glute ham raise, you're going to need to do hamstring curls. You might need to find a way to do them with bands if you don't have a machine. Be creative. Adapt, overcome. But no, a back extension cannot replace a glute ham raise. Cannot replace a glute ham raise. It doesn't work all the same heads of the muscle the same. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.